August is Water Month here at Rosie on the House. We've got a great opportunity to talk with Senator Cena Kerr of currently uh, Legislation District 13, but after the redistrict, it's going to be 25. And from what I understand, you have passed more legislation during this last session than any other senator on either side. Yes, well, I think uh, my colleagues in the House actually had a higher percentage, but in the Senate, I did have the highest percentage of of bills that got across the line and signed by the governor. Well, congratulations. And one of those bills is what has brought uh, us together today. Thank you for the time for this interview. We have uh, a new legislation signed June 6th, SB 7040, that allocates a billion dollars over the next three years to Arizona Water Resources. Yes, so that's Senate Bill 1740, and uh, the governor signed it. Um, June 6 is that, uh, I can't remember the the date that he signed it, but the general effective date will be September 24th, so that's when it's implemented. Uh, But in the meantime, uh, you know, the Water Infrastructure Finance Authority, which is where the uh, legislation is, is how we crafted it to sit under what we call WIFA, And so they are currently still in the process and will continue to be in the rulemaking uh, process as they uh, work to set up this new uh, program under their purview. And so WIF has been around a while. That was my question. Is this a brand new existing? Okay. Uh, So we, we chose to put it under an existing entity. And they've been around since 1997. Okay. And they've done an exceptional job, great reputation um, in distributing funds that come either from the federal government. And most recently, we had added some state dollars under their uh, purview. And so to date, they have distributed $2.6 billion in water infrastructure projects. And so they they were the you know the best entity to go to. They were already set up with the the basic structure. But what Senate Bill 1740 did, it expanded their authority and and will allow us to do what we hope to accomplish and what we expect to accomplish with with this bill. And in the governor's press release, he talks about a new board structure that's being appointed by legislation and governor as well. So there's additional, when you say expanded, there's still the selection process of who to put on that board. Exactly. So it was critically important that we um, fashion this legislation with plenty of oversight and transparency. You know, we're talking about a billion dollars of our hard-earned taxpayer dollars. And so we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we have that oversight in place. So there will be a total of nine members on this new expanded WIFA board, and four are direct legislative picks, four are from the governor, the executive picks, and one's a statewide pick. And that one will be selected by the governor from a list provided by the uh, by the president, uh, Senate president, and the speaker, and all the the water and finance uh, experts. So, uh, it provides a good balance, you know, good good oversight. And in addition to that, there's going to be a joint legislative water committee that will vet projects over fifty million dollars. And so there's there's different components to that financing, and there's uh, three pots of I guess buckets of water, I should say, that we provided. So um, there will be a $200 million conservation um, uh, program. Uh, Then there will be $250 million, what we call, um, uh, it'll be for in-state projects. And then the rest, about $750 million, will be uh, earmarked for those out-of-state, finding new water from out-of-state. And so that's essentially how the, the framework will work for the bill. Which is perfect lead into my next question is, so we've got 200 in conservation of existing water resources, 250 for in-state additional in-state water sources, and then 750 out of state. Now, the CAP was $4 billion, and they finished that in the 90s, and that took 30 years to build. So what what out of state resource can we find with 750 million? I mean, that <laughs> uh, 
compared to the CAP and budget size, that's like a little tiny straw coming in. <laughs> exactly. No. And that's a, a question that I'm frequently asked. And so we never intended for that $750 million for these projects to be only the state dollars. Uh, we're looking at partnerships, whether it's public-private partnerships, um, inter, you know, other states uh, type of partnerships. Uh, the uh, WIFA will be able to issue bonds, so that would be able uh, to provide, uh, you know, more borrowing power as you leverage those bonds. And so there's multiple ways that that money uh, can be utilized and you know, and stretched further to cover some major projects. Now, when you talk about out-of-state water resources, what are the first things that come to your mind as areas we should be looking? Because we we get a lot of feedback, and we, a common one has started to surface. And I'm just curious what what you're hearing and if they match up. Yeah, so probably you know the the first thing that comes to mind a lot of people ask about is a desal plant. How would that work? What does it look like? What are we thinking? We don't have anything solidified yet. You know, the uh, the entity isn't set up yet to receive uh, applications, but just some, you know, talk out there, you know, uh, partnering uh, again with maybe some type of public-private partnership to go into some type of desal plant. Maybe it'll be in the Sea of Cortez and, you know, the, the plant be built there. You know, Mexico's a partner with us um, on um, the R Colorado River allocation. So maybe that desal plant provides their allocation of the river to of the river water to leave more uh, of the river water behind Lake Mead uh, to shore up those levels. We've talked about uh, floodwater harvesting from either the Missouri River the Mississippi River, a lot of people say, oh, that's so far-fetched. No way. That's that's a crazy talk. But so was the CAP back in the day when people were talking about building a 336-mile aqueduct to bring in uh, Colorado River water to central Arizona and look at, look at what we have. Um, and so we need to think bold, big, have that same vision that our early founders had. And um, and just thinking outside the box, what else could be out there? Are there other partnerships with other states? You know, what more can we do? And so anything's possible. And when you're talking about bringing in floodwaters from the Mississippi River, you know, that's got – there's been a couple different reports I've seen. This one from Water Online talks about piping it from Jackson, Mississippi, across the south board of Colorado and into Utah that would spill into – uh, Lake Powell and start filling it up there. I've seen another one that would come out of Davenport and basically follow I-40 and drop it in in Wyoming and a tributary to the Colorado River. And so it would fill up the entire system, not just the lower basin region. Um, the biggest issue that keeps coming up is the power to move that water. You know, Central Arizona Project Canal it does not hide it. They'll tell you up front, we are the biggest user of electricity in the state of Arizona. It's expensive to move water. And they move it 336 miles. Coming over from the Mississippi, we're looking at closer to 1,000 miles. So where does the energy then come to move the water? And it's one of those funny things, you know, it takes water to create energy. <laughs> But we need the energy to move the water. So what what starts first? Where does where, where's the chicken or the egg in this? <laughs> exactly. No, and I think that's where the folks that specialize and that are the experts in this type of uh, innovative thinking will sort those problems out. Uh, if it's feasible to do it, you know they they'll get it figured out. And I have no doubt of the ability to be resourceful and innovative and, you know, do what we need to do. So is this out of state 750 million mainly just the research and concept ideas? And then we'll have to then go fund those ideas once uh, a plan of action has been put together or no telling at this point? Is that too early you to know, say? So the, the WIFA then serves as a finance authority. So the projects will come to the board, and then they will vet those projects and finance them. So uh, they WIFA won't actually be out looking and, uh, you know, People out. will be bringing ideas to yes. them. So yes. So mm -hmm. as me, Joe, homeowner, and I had an idea, how would I present that to WIFA? 
Well, there's going to be a vetting process. It's going to be quite intensive and and you know you would have to have everything uh, in order and be able to uh, to prove that you can get this project done and meet all types of different criteria there will be a needs assessment ongoing from the department of water resources they are putting together a map of the entire state and where are the greatest needs so there's there's criteria that the board will follow um, in in order to award those um, those contracts. So is there an application that people go? Yes, there will be an application process and that's currently, you know, all in the works as well. So, you know, the board needs to be set up, the application process, all, all that rulemaking that I talked about earlier mm-hmm. uh, is in the process right now. It's going to be a lot of work, but it's going to ensure that, that $750 million doesn't get wasted. Yes, yes, absolutely. And again, the oversight uh, that the the board will have, and then the Joint Legislative uh, Committee on Water as well. And so it looks like I, I'm i getting word that there will be a centralized application website pub- publicized as early as next week. Oh, wow. So we're really getting, uh, getting to work on it. One of the main things we wanted to make sure when we were setting this up, the, the whole committee, everybody that, that worked on this bill took a lot of input, a lot of people at the table was that we had a structure that would really work. Uh, Oftentimes government thinks, you know, okay, we're going to put this uh, program together. And then there's just too many hoops to jump through. And uh, different groups, different entities can't really utilize it. But we wanted to make sure, first of all, that our rural areas uh, were able to access. So that's why they have that separate funding. And some of those... Loans, they could be loans, they could be grants. It, it depends on what type of projects come in. And again, same with the conservation projects. And and so that's the goal, is that it really is usable. The last thing we need is something, you know, set up that no one can access or that it's, you know, it's not workable. And, um, and that was the beauty of having the stakeholder input that we had, the water experts, uh, and the, the entire team that it took uh, to put this bill together. And one of the questions I have, I think is probably a little too early, is, is what projects are being considered, but we don't even have the board together yet to present those, and the application's not out. So all of those uh, are coming soon. Yes, they sure are. And so we'll see how it all rolls out. Uh, you know, oftentimes in our bills, we intend it to work a certain way, but when you actually get into it, you know, maybe it needs a tweak here, a tweak there, and uh, that's certainly expected. We're always uh, fixing, you know, and uh, fixing our bills and making sure that they work as we intended and, and that we can right away start solving some in-state water issues, uh, maybe a municipality, a city, uh, way in the rural areas, may not have the population, the tax base, all of that to implement a project that they, they're they ready to go with, but they just need that funding. So this is what we envision uh, with this, with 1740, is that those municipalities will be able to come uh, apply for their, you know, for their project and for funding and be able then um, to draw down maybe some federal dollars, also matching dollars, um, however it might work for them. And then, of course, depending on the project and the situation, some loans will be forgivable, forgivable some grants. Interesting. Now, if you were going to be presenting, you know, and, and your background for anybody that's not familiar, you know, y'all have been in the agricultural business, ran a, still have the family uh, dairy, Kerr Dairy out in Buckeye that the uh, family, the next generation is, I wouldn't say pushing y'all out, but... <laughs> You can say that. Carrying the torch. <laughs> yes. We're, we're passing on that that baton for sure. So, I mean, y'all have been involved in water use and multiple different levels as homeowners, as uh, part of the agricultural community. And we are put a survey together that we've put out on our social media. We've put it in our newsletter. Uh, we've mentioned it a few times. And uh, just for anybody listening to go fill out, if you were in charge of that purse, what three areas – would you be looking at? Do you have in your mind uh, where where the biggest bang for our buck, category wise, should be? Well, you know, you're you're talking to a farmer, so <laughs> of course, for me, uh, always a priority. Uh, 
for our state is that we work as hard as we can to preserve uh, our agriculture industry. And we have an incredibly robust industry. And I mean, we put food on everyone's table. It's important that we have a, a local abundant supply of food. Also, we also have a, a national presence as well. A part of my district, I represent Yuma, Yuma County. And from November to March, Yuma County produces 90% of the leafy greens consumed in the nation. So it's critically important and it has a national consequence uh, that we we make sure that our farmers keep farming. Uh, they've done an incredible job with water efficiency. We've had to. We've always looked at that and know probably more than, than most how critical uh, our water is. And so we always work on uh, the latest technologies, which help us be more efficient, which lead to using less water, and even less land. Are there any standout instances or, or inventions that y'all have implemented that run that, that stick out in your mind over the course of y'all's, you know, farming career? One of the biggest things for us, of course, is you know making sure every field is laser leveled. Um, we flood irrigate because we grow alfalfa, we grow sorghum silages, um, ryegrass, oats, different things. All and things to feed the all cattle. All things to feed the cows. <laughs> and so, you know, that water is a huge expense to us. So we want to make sure it is as efficient as we can be. So make sure ditches are lined, fields are, are lasered. But there's some great, exciting technologies coming out. We've been using, I say we, in Arizona, subsurface subsurface irrigation uh, for many years. Our farmers in Pinal County are some of the most uh, efficient users of water. And so they've been using it for many years. But as technologies roll out, it, it gets just really exciting of how much more water we can use. There's a company out there that is, um, it's called NDRIP. They've got just amazing technology and I look to see that being utilized by farmers where they can. There was even a separate bill uh, uh, that we passed this session, $30 million, towards irrigation efficiencies uh, type of technologies. It didn't have to be this particular one. It can be any kind of um, irrigation efficient technology that takes a farmer from flood ir irrigation to, you know, more subsurface type of of irrigation. And that actually hits my number two is any field that is viable for going subsurface irrigation, we convert it. Uh, the Alfalfa Project, are you familiar with that, that organization? I'm not. No. It's They're in Southern California, and their goal is to convert all alfalfa to uh, subsurface irrigation, drip irrigation of the soil. So there's no evaporation on top. The water is emitted through the soil right to the root ball, so you you need you use less of it to grow your uh, grow your alfalfa. Mm -hmm. And alfalfa is one of the main crops in all the southern basin for uh, California and Arizona. And I know, according to what Julie Murphy from the spokeswoman for the Arizona Farm Bureau has said, not all of our soil types are conducive to that uh, sub drip irrigation. But any of our farmlands that could be converted to that. I think uh, would pay off huge dividends instead of the the traditional flood irrigation. Work. Exactly. No, and our farmers, you know, as as efficient as we are, we're always willing and ready to try uh, that new technology. A lot of the issue that can be prohibitive is the cost, and so I think uh, you know we're making sure that uh, that our farmers have the best chance to utilize. Uh, these technologies that can save an awful lot of water. Yeah, <clears throat> their stats on their or their goal is to convert 235,000 acres of alfalfa just in the San Joaquin Valley alone, and that would reduce water use by 77 percent. Which, if we were using 77 percent less water in alfalfa, that would almost uh, level out the the shortages that we're in. So it would be a great a great solution. Like I said, it's expensive, takes a lot of time and infrastructure, but that's something we could do in real time if they did build a pipeline from the Mississippi River. I mean, it took it took 20 plus years to get CAP done at, at 
336 miles. I don't know how many years it would take to pipe that in. I'm not saying it won't ever happen, but that's not a real-time solution, converting farmland. And a lot of people get cynical about the farmland itself. Well, then, you know, what if, if we just furlough the farm? Well, then what are you going to eat? And I was listening to your podcast when you were in studio with Bill in 2017 with us talking about the dairy farm and just you're getting milk from cows to grocery store shelves in 30 hours. And if we didn't have the local dairy cows and the feed for them to produce the milk, how far is that milk going to have to come from? Exactly. That's why it's so important and a real passion of mine. And we're down to about 24 hours now. We can go from milk oh, from okay. the farm right. to the, the grocery store shelves. We just keep uh, getting more and more efficient. And and we need that food to be local. It's really important. As we saw through the pandemic, when every state was in the same situation, we were all locked down. I tell you what, I was really grateful for Arizona agriculture. We were able to keep the store shelves full with um, with our local produce and dairy products and meat, all those things. Um, Arizona is just a real powerhouse for agriculture. So outside of agriculture, what else are we looking at? You know, I think it's important that we uh, continue to, to grow um, economically as well. And so that we grow smart and, and then we have a, a good plan uh, for the future. And I feel like we've done that. Arizona has been a leader for many years in water management. And so I think, you know, we continue along that path. Um, I have no doubt of our success. That's just what we do. We've, we're known for that. When uh, push comes to shove, we get it done. And, um, and then, you know, again, all of this to make sure that our future, uh, not just in the next few years, but we're talking, you know, the next hundred years, that we have a secure water future. And I think a, a unique thing about Arizona, we have, you know, you look in the eastern part of the state, we have the Salt and Verde River systems that SRP manages. Those are doing quite well. And then we have other parts of the state that really have a good supply of water. Our farm happens to be in a waterlogged area. If you can imagine that, we're <laughs> pumping water 24-7 out of the ground uh, to make sure that the water level is, uh, is where it needs to be so we can grow our crops and that water does not go to waste. And so you look around the state, it's, it's not all dire, and, but certainly the Colorado River water, that's the, the main concern. And about 36% of our water use in Arizona is dependent upon the Colorado River. So that that's our priority right now. And I'll come back to that one because I want to finish with that one. But you had mentioned desalination as well. Uh, there's The problem there has always been the cost mm -hmm. of it. It's, it's a very expensive process. But technology, new development, new ideas, innovation. And there's a lot of things that, that can change that. Have you seen this um, pipeline into the Sea of Galilee that they're looking at doing in Israel? Taking five different water sources from outside the Sea of Galilee, which is funny, it's a sea, but it's a freshwater lake. So, you know, you're coming from the Mediterranean and probably the Persian Gulf, and they're going to be piping water into that lake and as it's that travel path, it's going to be cleaned and desalinated. So they're going to be restoring the lake that they're pumping water out of. And, you know, so that's a, an interesting concept. You know, I don't when we're talking about pumping out of the Sea of Cortez. Is there a you know, does that then go into the Santa Cruz River that's south of us, but it flows north and it could resupply the Gila River? <laughs> You know, there's. A, I've actually had an opportunity to sit down with some folks from Israel working on the desal issue and talking about their technology. It's just fascinating. And so certainly, you know, utilizing those technologies. And then it's yet to be seen, you know, how it would work, how it would play out uh, in the Sea of Cortez, still in the talking stages, of course. And, you know, there, there are experts there that will be doing the planning and, and deciding what's the best way uh, to set up a desal and, you know, how to use it. Um, and so I, I think it's very exciting to see what can happen, especially with today's uh, technology that's really improved. 
And one of the improved technologies I've been following, and again, yet to be seen on a large scale, uh, the product's still in development. Have you seen Glan, Glanris out of Mississippi? I have not. So they took the number one ag waste product in the world and turned it into a filter. And they claim completely organic. It's rice hulls. So after all these rice gets processed, you know, that the casing around it, you know, like you're shucking a corn husk, you know, the casing around the rice, that all gets burned or uh, thrown away. Well, they've started taking that and compressing it into water filters, and it's all gravity fed. So they just pour the water on top. It comes out the bottom purified. It's pretty fascinating. Like I said, it, that would be hard to, descale lar- to do a desalination large scale on a gravity feed, but not to say that you know the development in the future won't make that something that is uh, you know, can be pressurized filtration. But you know that's very interesting taking a organic byproduct and turning it into a, a water filter system. Now we don't have to create these synthetic filters that you know. Then what do you do with them after after their point of view? So now you got to throw them away. <laughs> exactly. No, that's very exciting, and you know that's the kind of thing when I say you know. Uh, in ag, there's so much um, innovation and resourcefulness out there to tap into. And so I love that. Love that idea. Well, we'll wrap up with going back to the Colorado River. And uh, the last question, have you seen or heard of the concept of primary water? You know, you um, mentioned that earlier um, in, in an email. And so I, I looked at that. But um, up until that, I hadn't heard it called that. So it must be much deeper. Of course, we have our aquifers uh, in Arizona. And but it looks to me from the little bit I read that that's much deeper water. Am I correct on that? So according to the concept, Mm -hmm. and I have asked everybody that I had talked to, have you ever heard of this? Have you ever heard? Nobody has ever heard of it. But explained, it makes perfect sense. So, you know, Horton Springs, for example, there's water flowing out of the mountain. Where's that water coming from? You talk about our deep water aquifers. We have to pump that. That takes energy and electricity to pump that. There's no electricity pumping Horton Springs out. Where's, and there's no snowpack above it in the summer that it could be melting, seeping through the ground and coming out of the It's constant, it's consistent, and it's been flowing for years. Where's that energy source? You know, the primary water concept explains it that that's the Earth's energy and underneath the crust there is twice the volume of water that's currently in our oceans and water's constantly being produced inside the earth and is pushed to the surface and natural springs that's where it's coming from that's water that's worked its way through cracks in the crust and it's poured into the our atmosphere it's water that's never before been in circulation um and so when i look at that and a couple years ago, I say a couple, it's been over a decade, I had the opportunity to float the Colorado River or a portion of it. And there's a, a spring there that they stop at and you get out and you get to look at it. It's called Pumpkin Springs. And it's very, uh, it's, it's called Pumpkin because it's very orange because of all the sulfur. And um, then there's another spring not far behind it that are constantly just pouring water into the river. So like if primary water theory is correct, wouldn't you just look at the agri, agri um, wouldn't you look at geographical maps of where the fault lines and the cracks and the earthquakes are? I mean, Arizona has its own map of, of the earthquakes, and there's more than you would think happening all the time. They're just not the size that, that we generally feel. That's where the Primary Water Institute looks to start drilling when they're hired to drill a primary well. Couldn't you just find three dozen places to poke holes and just let it fall into the tributaries. And, you know, if we had uh, 100 gallons a minute on average per primary well pouring 24-7 into our waterways, filling up our aquifers, there could be a point in time that we don't necessarily need the Colorado River right now. CAP could be supplying, SRP could be supplying CAP the water that they aren't pumping out of of the Colorado River because we've got these additional constant streams of water flowing into into our tributaries. I don't know that it's realistic, but the concept isn't being shared anywhere. And it 
it, it seems very fascinating. It is con- very fascinating. Theory. There could be people maybe I just haven't connected with that are already, you know, studying this and experts in that area. So I, I think it's really fascinating. I'd like to look into it more. Well, and then if we could prove it worked in Arizona and we could take that to a federal level and have primary wells just pouring, you know, pump in another hundred all along the Colorado River where they're just constantly, I'm not saying it's going to solve the problem entirely, but you know, it's certainly going to make it a more resilient process. And, you know, if the fills up the reservoirs and at a point we ever have too much, we well, just let that much more water down the river. It goes out into the Sea of Cortez and everyone's happy. Exactly. Sounds like a win-win. <laughs> no, that's really fascinating. So it's it's something we try and talk about without being uh, overkill and, and super redundant here on the program just to get <clears throat> that awareness of it out there. To find the right people that could study it and say, yes, this is true, we can, or you know what, no, this isn't, uh, this concept isn't proved true and we need to look at somewhere else. But, you know, that in state 250 million, I'm going to put an application in for a study of primary water. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Very good. No, I'll pose that question out there to those water experts and yeah, I'll see what I can find out. Is there anything you'd like to wrap up with? You know, I'm just really grateful that we live in a state that has the the economic fortitude that we are in a position because of our good, um, conservative, pro-business, pro-taxpayer policy that we have the funding and the wherewithal uh, to invest this kind of money. It's so important. Water is life to everyone. And so I'm really grateful that we have that. I'm, I'm grateful for the water leaders that came before us, those that are with us, looking at our, our water needs each and every day. We have the best of the best looking at our water needs. And, and I'm grateful for a legislature that understands the importance and that we were able to get something like this through. They're first in the nation of this magnitude. And I think we had one no vote in each chamber. And, you know, that's that says a lot. It was uh, very successful. It took a lot of hard work. Um, I'm, I'm really, truly appreciative of all the stakeholders, every, every single person that came to the table and had ideas, our my colleagues, incredible colleagues, been been there much longer than I have. That great gave great input. Our staff, both in the Senate, in the House, in the governor's office, it all came together and wasn't always easy. And there was some real, you know, heated moments. But I've I've learned to appreciate that tension because it's it's in that tension it's in that moment that we're crafting the best legislation that we can because we're looking at all sides of this issue and you know this was a, a great bipartisan effort and and I I look for this to be re- truly successful that the the groups that come that apply that they will be able to utilize this get some real water programs and infrastructure done, uh, whatever that looks like. And uh, I'm just really looking forward to see how this is all implemented and and how it all works out. And outside of this bill, what else are y'all working on? Oh, my goodness. (laughs) (laughs) This this is just one bill. (laughs) Right. There's always, uh, always several, uh, quite a few things going on. So we're in our interim uh, right now. We, Sine died, was it? June 24th or the 25th, hard to remember, those last (laughs) few days are always uh, kind of run together. And so the interim is is for many members, you know, time to get caught up. Uh, Maybe we have different study committees that went through. And so those are being set up and will be uh, convening after the general effective date. And so I'm uh, working on an off-highway vehicle study committee. I will be on a hydrogen study committee. And and so we're, you know, always looking at at all the different uh, issues that that affect the state. I chair our Natural Resource Energy and Water Committee. So most of the time, that's what I'm focused on and involved in. Every now and then, it's something, you know, kind of uh, outside of my wheelhouse. Uh, Victims' rights are very important to me. We were able to get through uh, an 
incredible victims' rights bill this year. Again, first of its kind in the nation to protect uh, victims of, of sexual abuse and other abuses. And so, you know, that's, you know, that's really out there for me. But I love that. I love the challenge of having to learn all about a new issue. And again, I depend on the experts, uh, our staff and stakeholders and uh, you know, anybody I can bring in that's an expert in that field that can help me uh, fashion a piece of legislation that will not only uh, benefit the constituents, you know, that, that bring me these things, but to be a benefit to all of Arizona and hopefully the nation as well. Now, how has it been going into politics? Because you don't have a history of politics. Family doesn't have a history of politics. Y'all were dairy farmers. And I talked to one of your family members ahead of the interview and he said, yeah, you know, it's 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 great because uh, instead of just sitting around complaining about it like I do, Cena actually is doing something about it now, and uh, I said everyone's real happy for uh, for the work you've done. But I mean, I I read SB seventeen forty. It's fifty six pages of blah 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 blah. That it's like you need a dictionary, you need an Arizona law book, you need a thesaurus, uh, and. And, and it's 56 pages. You'd probably have a thousand pages of notes to, to go look up and follow up to understand everything. How was it uh, getting immersed into this uh, element of politics and, and understanding the law writing. <laughs> yes. Well, gratefully, you know, we, we are a, uh, a citizen legislature. And so uh, for me, that's, that's the beauty of getting to do that. You know, an ordinary citizen like me, dairy farmer, and, you know, to be able to step in to this arena, you know, you, you, run a campaign, you hope, you know, you get elected, that people will trust you to come, to go to the Capitol and work hard for them. And so we depend then, and I depend on, on our staff, on our legislative council. So you, you give them your idea, your thought, uh, the area of statute that you would like to change or add to whatever it is. And then they help you fashion that, uh, into the the language that's needed so that it's conformed into that uh, statutory language and they're the experts in that and so a lot of times it's like okay i want it to do this this and this and they come back with this big old you know paragraph that's really uh, formal sounding and you're like okay i you know that that'll do the trick so it really is a fascinating process and and i love most of all when constituents come to me with an issue that's really affecting them on their farm and their business or their daily life and they go we need to change the law and i can say well let's do it and together we work on it and uh, get it through the process uh, there's nothing like it to go from start to finish that moment when the governor signs your bill and becomes law and you're impacting somebody's life and really making a difference. Um, there's, there's no greater privilege, in my opinion, to get to do that. So I'm really honored. Senator Cena Kerr, Kerr Dairy, and uh, District 13, soon to be District 25. Yes. Well, thank you so much for having me, Romy. And, you know, anytime. I just love coming on. Uh, sad I missed your folks today. Tell them hello for me. And I will. So I, I got pictures. They were enjoying some of Arizona Waters ways. They were uh, paddleboarding and kayaking Watson Lake with uh, family in from uh, Germany, actually. My brother-in-law is in the Army, and uh, they're stationed overseas and in town for a few weeks so oh. they they got up to the mountain country for a few days <laughs> that's wonderful great good for them that's great well best of luck to you and uh all the work that y'all are putting together and we will definitely have to keep in touch about uh you know this 10 1040 as the wifa 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 the WIFA board gets put together and as an application uh, comes online and uh, the elements that uh, consist of that and if somebody's got an idea how to take that next step and put it into an application process. Absolutely. Yeah, you'll have to have me back on and I'll give you an update after it's all rolling out. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Romy.